Good evening. It is good to see you tonight. Our first reading is from the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, chapters 18 and 22. It begins on page 13 of your pew Bibles. It is part of the story of Sarah and Abraham. You know this story. It begins with a promise, a promise from God to Abraham. God says to Abraham, go from your country and your people and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. In you, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed. So understandably, Abraham and Sarah leave their hometown in Mesopotamia in search of this promised land, and they bring along Lot, who is Abraham's nephew, and all of Lot's people, which, looking back on it, you would have to say was a mistake. And that by no means was the last mistake that Abraham would make. And yet, despite all the mistakes, through all the adventures and misadventures, through all the years, God again and again repeats the promise. Look up at the sky, Abraham. Your offspring shall be more numerous than those stars. Think of the sea, Abraham. Your offspring shall be more numerous than the sands by the sea. Now, it goes without saying that if your offspring are going to be that numerous, you'll need at least one thing, offspring, or at least one offspring. And for years and years and years and years and years, Abraham and Sarah have none, no children. Which brings us to tonight's first reading. Because in this passage, an angel has an announcement to make. Sarah and Abraham, yes, after all these years, Sarah and Abraham are going to have a baby. Sometimes we entertain angels unawares. I'll be reading from chapter 18, beginning with verse 1. Listen now for God's Word. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. The one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord who has now made an appearance, said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And God said, Oh, yes, you did laugh. Now, when God makes a promise, God keeps that promise. So a few chapters later, in chapter 21 on page 16 of your pew Bibles, we get the fulfillment of this promise. Listen again for God's Word. The Lord dealt with Sarah as He had said, 
And the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days days old as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would have ever said to Abraham and Sa- that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? O oh Lord, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and redeemer. Amen. The place to start is with a woman laughing, an old woman. So says Frederick Buechner, and I agree. Her face is cracked and rutted like a six-month drought. She hunches her shoulders around her ears and starts to shake. She squinnies her eyes shut and her laughter is all china teeth and wheeze and tears running down as she rocks back and forth in her kitchen chair. She is laughing because she is pushing 91 and has just been told she is going to have a baby. Hers is the laughter of faith. Hers is the laughter of heaven. Or at least hers is like the laughter you will hear in heaven and as close as we may get here on earth. If you have to explain a joke, why bother? The explanation will just suck the humor right out of the joke. With that having been said, I'm going to warn you. I'm now about to explain not a particular joke, but humor in general. Humor depends on incongruity and our recognition thereof. In its deepest and richest sense, it depends on a recognition of incongruity that yields a sense of unexpected fulfillment. Did you hear that sucking sound? Just took all the laughter right out of humor. Okay, try this. The ancient sage walks along, his eyes fixed upward, contemplating the majesty of the stars, knowing their secret courses. And then, of course, he slips on a banana peel. Oldest joke in the world, and a couple of you still laughed. And you can see the incongruity here, can't you? Our heavenly aspirations and our all too earthly bodies. You don't think of those two going together, but they do, and it's funny. Even the lowly pun. You take a word or a sound-alike word with one familiar meaning and stick it in a different context where it doesn't belong. There's the incongruity. And then suddenly there's another meaning, and it's funny, or at least funny to the punster. England has no kidney bank, but it does have a Liverpool. I got a job at a bakery because I needed dough. That's K-N-E-A, I have to explain it. Uh, You groan, but see, you're recognizing the incongruity. And you can recognize the incongruities in our scripture reading tonight, can't you? The baby being born in the geriatric ward and Medicare picking up the bill. Well, not quite picking it up, actually. But fortunately, Abraham and Sarah thought ahead and purchased Medigap coverage. Though I have to tell you that their coverage required the government to come up with a new designation. You've heard of Medigap coverage A, B, C, running all the way up to Q, R, S, and T. But this was Medigap coverage part U, as in, you got to be kidding me. At least to the punster, at least to the punster. Anyway... I hope you can also see that this incongruity yields a sense of unexpected fulfillment. Now, now, after all these years, now when I am old and Abraham's even older, now after all these ups and downs, now 
God says, I'm going to have a baby. Now, God will finally fulfill His promise. Who could have imagined it? Who would have thunk it? Only God. Only God. And because this is the laughter of fulfillment, it is like all laughter of true joy, mixed with tears because it is wonderful, too wonderful to be true. But then again, is anything too wonderful for the Lord? You know, Abraham is called the father of faith by Christians, Jews, and Muslims, and that's fine. He deserves it. Abraham continued to trust in God, to believe in God's promises, even when the fulfillment of those promises seemed impossible. Abraham believed, and believed that even though for human beings it is impossible, for God all things are possible. And that's why he's called the father of faith, and that's fine. But Sarah, I think, well, I think we should call her the mother of faith. And why? Because she laughed. She laughed when she didn't have to. You know, she could have gotten offended even angry at God for this. Now, now after all these years, now when I'm old and he's even older, now after all these ups and downs, all those waiting, now God says I'm going to have a baby when my body can't take it, now God's going to fulfill his promise? I don't think so. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to have any part of it. God can get somebody else. Thank you very much. She could have said that, but instead she laughed. In his book, The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis imagines the waiting room of heaven, not because he thinks heaven really has a waiting room, but because he's trying to make a point. Anyway, when you get to the waiting room of heaven, what will happen? Will you have to recite the Apostles' Creed so you can get in? Okay, but I hope I memorized the right version. Will you have to watch a taped replay of your entire life, all the good and all the bad? For my part, I hope not. Or should you just throw yourselves on the mercy of the Lord? A pretty good strategy, if you ask me. But according to Lewis, none of the above. What will happen is that someone you know will come out from heaven proper to greet you in this waiting room and to lead you back into heaven. And, and here's the kicker, it will be someone you think has no business whatsoever being in heaven. And now the question, when so met and greet it, what will you do? For example, when you look at me and in shock and surprise think to yourself, geez, I thought the standards for clergy would have been higher. Are you going to laugh or are you going to be offended? And who knows, maybe by the grace of our Lord, I'll laugh with you and we can laugh together and maybe I'll be laughing over the low standards for clergy and mission too, though maybe I'll be laughing for other reasons that I'm not going to tell you about. Anyway, let's hope we'll share a laugh together in heaven. Because to laugh is to say that our God is a God of infinite surprise who will always keep His promises, who will pull the iron out of the fire even when it seems impossible, no, especially when it seems impossible, and do so in a way that is both wondrous and unthinkable, but then when you think about it, it is so wonderful and so fitting, it's just the kind of thing God would do. And to laugh like that is to laugh with God, to have faith in God, to trust the promise giver, to believe in the promises, and despite all the trials and tribulations and the ups and downs of our lives, to believe that those promises have come true. On the other hand, it's possible not to laugh. It's possible to say, if you and people like you are here then I don't want any part of heaven. I'd rather be in hell, thank you very much. But be careful, because according to C.S. Lewis, if we say that, 
we will indeed get our wish. But why would we or anyone say that? Well, maybe because we can't take a joke. Can't take the joke, the joke of God's grace, the joke of God's using the most incongruous means, including people like us, to make all those wonderful promises come true. Who woulda thunk it? A 90-year-old woman becoming a first-time mother and Abraham and Sarah thereby becoming the parents of a great nation and a blessing to all nations. Who would have thunk it? The Messiah, the Holy One, the Son of the Most High, the Son of God, condemned as a criminal, dying a gruesome death on a cross. And thereby us, with our earthly bodies, having all of our heavenly aspirations and then some fulfilled. Who would have thunk it? Only God. Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? And yes, and then Sarah. She can think it. She can think the thoughts of after God, of God after God. And in response, she can only laugh the laughter of faith, and the laughter of heaven. Sarah is the mother of faith. And in response to Sarah's laughter, a laughter she tries unsuccessfully to stifle when she realizes that she's in the presence of God, what does God do? God tells Sarah and Abraham to name their child Isaac, which in Hebrew means laughter. Beekner again. Far from getting angry at Sarah for laughing, God not only tolerated her laughter but blessed it, and in a sense joined it in Himself, which makes it very special laughter indeed. God and man laughing together, sharing a glorious joke in which both are involved. And Sarah is not the only one who's in on this glorious joke. Abraham laughs too. In fact, if you go to the 11th chapter of Hebrews, our second scripture reading tonight, and peruse the great honor roll of faith, you'll find that all of those listed, in one way or another, shared in God's laughter. Abraham and Sarah, Moses and Miriam, Joshua and Rahab, Barak and Deborah, Jephthah and his daughter, to name only a few. They all trusted and believed that God will keep His promises, however incongruous and numerous the means He will use to do it. And I hope, as I read off some of the names from that honor roll, you heard those women's names. For the next few months, Caitlin, Jim, and I will be focusing our sermons on women in the Bible. Now, you don't have to read too far in the Bible to see that women don't usually get speaking parts. And that, of course, reflects the sexism of the times. And you don't have to read too far in the Bible to see that sometimes the treatment of women is not just unsettling but horrific. And there is no doubt another reflection of the sexism of the times. One scholar has called these stories text of terror. And if you're expecting every such story that depicts such treatments of women to immediately condemn that kind of treatment, I'm going to warn you, you're going to be disappointed. The Bible does give us explicit moral instruction. Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and self, and your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Do what I do, Paul says. Imitate Jesus. And this instruction is more than sufficient for us to condemn that kind of terror. But the Bible doesn't give us neat, tidy morals at the end of every chapter. It wouldn't be as rich or as interesting a book if it did. But what you will see in these stories about women in the Bible, time and time again, is that our God is a God of infinite surprise. And this means that God will sometimes, often in fact, 
overturn the social order, a social order usually oppressive to women, and overturn the natural order in order to fulfill his promise. And this means that women end up playing surprising roles. To wit, a 90-year-old woman becomes the hero of faith because she's going to have a baby and because she believes it and can laugh about it. If that's not overturning the social and natural order, I don't know what is. Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? As we preach in the weeks ahead, we'll try to give these women, so many of whom are rendered silent, we'll try to give these women voice. But we do that not just to give them voice, but to give voice to their faith. Because it is their faith that makes them great and their faith that we should aspire to. But now, for tonight, the place to start is with a woman laughing. The story begins with a promise, but the place to start is with a woman laughing. She is an old woman. She is laughing because she believes the promises of God and trusts the one who made them. She is laughing because she has faith and because she will become the mother of our faith as well as the mother of a child who will be named Laughter. And she turns to us and says, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. May it be so for us. Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? Amen.